Logan's at Gamescom in Germany. You have questions about the Asus Z170 Deluxe. I can't hear you, so I'm just going to guess what those questions are and answer those questions in hopes that the questions that I'm guessing are basically the questions that you have to ask, but right after the bump. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. No, we're going to take a look today at the Asus Z170 Deluxe motherboard. This is a mainstream motherboard. Now, the Z170 chipset and the Skylake CPU, it's codenamed Skylake. If you don't know about Skylake and you've been living under a rock, you should check out our video on Skylake because it'll explain everything. This motherboard is designed for Skylake. So if you've got a, an existing CPU or you're looking at upgrading, you're going to have to get a new processor and motherboard if you didn't know that. And you really should go check out that other video if I'm talking some sort of crazy voodoo language. This board has a lot of features and is designed to sort of be the the channel board is what asus calls it but what that really means is that it's sort of the the everyman motherboard now this is the high-end version of the everyman motherboard there are some other variants of this motherboard that go all the way back to the z170a which is sort of a a lower price point version of this motherboard that's using the z170 chipset so the z170 chipset basically does everything that you can do with the skylake platform Let's take a quick look at the motherboard. This is an LGA 1151 socket, which is designed for the sixth generation Intel Core i3, i5, i7, Pentium, Celeron, whatever processors. This is the Intel Z170 Express chipset. It has four DIMM slots, advertising support for up to 64 gigabytes of DDR4. The maximum memory speed that you could run on this board is 3733 on all four slots. And you will really probably want to run DDR4-3000 with this platform if you can. Although DDR4-2133 would be perfectly fine. It's just that older DDR4-2133 kits were a little loose and sort of relied on the X99 being sort of tolerant of uh, loose timings as far as the memory goes. So keep that in mind when you're shopping for memory. So in terms of expansion slots on this motherboard, we've got two PCI Express 3.0 uh, by 16 slots. It's single at by 16 or in dual mode, you'll have by eight by eight. And it's not really anything different than we had with Haswell. Then you've got one PCI Express 3.0 by 16 slot, which is maximum at by four mode. And it's compatible with PCIe by one by two and by four devices. And then you've got four PCI Express 2.0 by one ports. At the back of the motherboard, we've got optical SPDIF, HDMI 2.0, DisplayPort. This is a 3x3 dual band Wi-Fi plus Bluetooth 4.0. It's a USB 3.1 Type-C port and then five USB 3.1 Type-A ports. And you've got the eight channel audio with DTS support. That's actually powered by Crystal Sound 3. With audio shielding a D-pop circuit. It has a built-in audio amplifier to drive high impedance headphones. It has separate PCB layers for the left and right audio jack. And then it has premium Nishikon audio capacitors. So in terms of storage connectivity, you've got eight SATA 6.0 gigabit per second ports. Two of those are from a SATA Express connector, so you can use two of the eight ports for SATA Express and be fine. It's got one M.2 slot, which supports both SATA and PCI Express connectivity. Now this is a PCI Express by four Gen 3, which is nice. The two gigabit LANs on the back are the Intel i219V gigabit LAN and the Intel i211 AT gigabit LAN. The audio codec is a Realtek ALC 1150 eight channel high definition audio codec, which is Crystal Sound 3. Now one thing that the Z170 chipset does not support is USB 3.1, but ASUS has added as media controllers to this motherboard to give you six USB 3.1 10 gigabit per second ports. There are also five additional USB 3.0 ports, four at the midboard and one at the back. And then for USB 2.0 connectivity, there are a total of five USB 2.0 ports. There are four ports on the motherboard that are on headers, and then there's one port at the back panel. That lone USB 2 connector is also used by USB BIOS flashback, and that's why it's on the back panel. Now, even though both of these onboard network cards are Intel, it does actually come with traffic shaping software to help you with low latency gaming. The Z170 Deluxe has a three-year warranty from Asus. Now, one interesting feature of the Z170 Deluxe is Key Express. Key Express is a dedicated USB port on the back of the motherboard. You can actually have macros run in hardware by a microcontroller that's on the motherboard. So there's a programmable microcontroller on the motherboard, so you can set up shortcut keys to do certain things with the system. Not only specific macros that you have, like an ordinary keyboard macro, but you can also set up function keys to actually get you into the UEFI. So you can just hit a key on your keyboard and it'll just boot directly into the UEFI. So in the box, you've got three bags of SATA cables. That's a total of six SATA cables. You get your IO backplate, which has cool sort of metalized blue artwork on it. It actually sort of, this is the first time that I've ever looked at a backplate and thought, mm, that's nifty. Also in the box, you've got a PCI Express to M.2 adapter, so you can actually run a second M.2 card if you want. And you've also got the M.2 to mini SAS adapter so that you can run mini SAS drives like the Intel 750, which is currently the fastest 
uh, PCI Express SSD that, that is out there. Of course, it's not going to fit in an M.2 slot, but you can put one of these in the M.2 slot and then actually run a cable from here. This is a mini SAS connector. We're running PCI Express signals over a mini SAS type cable uh, out to the Intel SSD, and then there you go. If you're already using the M.2 and you want to use an add-in card, well then you can use this adapter to actually do that. You've got the wireless antenna adapter, which is your external wireless antenna. You get your key headers, which makes it a little easier to wire up your front panel because you can wire up all your front panel cables to this and then plug it into your motherboard because this is all clearly labeled. You don't have to try to read the silk screen on the motherboard. You can just read the, the writing on the side of the connector, hook up your front panel connectors and, and then be good to go. So this is like your hard drive LED and your reset button and your power button and your power LED. You can hook all that up to this and then plug this into the motherboard. Life's a little easier. You've also got your SLI bridge, and then you get this little plastic CPU installation helper. Now what you can do is snap your CPU into this, and then snap this into the motherboard socket. The idea here is that these LGA sockets are insanely sensitive. They're insanely delicate. It's very bad if you accidentally touch the socket. It's very bad if you drop anything in the CPU socket. It's very bad if you look at the CPU socket sideways. Do not taunt happy fun CPU socket. So ASUS has included this nifty little tool to actually sort of snap around the processor and then you can install the processor. Now you gotta be careful here because this I think increases the chances slightly that you might accidentally touch the bottom of the CPU, which is almost as bad, but not quite as bad as actually touching the pins in the socket. If you do accidentally touch the, the pins on the bottom of the CPU, you can at least clean your fingerprint oils off with a Q-tip, like clean it off until you're absolutely sure that there's no oil left and then continue cleaning it off for about another five minutes and perhaps you will not have destroyed your CPU. You've also got these label stickers for the Key Express software. So you can actually peel these off and stick these to your, to your keyboard so that you remember what you set up the keys to do. So the out of the box functions in addition to regular key macros, you've got options for setting up direct key, which will take you directly into the UEFI, easy XMP, which will automatically se select the XMP overclock profile of your memory. Theoretically, when you buy memory and it comes with an XMP profile, it's not really exactly overclocking because the CPU and the memory are designed to work at that speed. Although the CPU is not exactly designed to work at that speed, it is a little bit, but not really. I'm sort of, sort of not exactly giving you the whole story there, but the memory will run at whatever speed it's rated for in the XMP profile. It may just require a higher voltage or some other considerations, but basically it's okay. Then you've got the power switch label, so you can turn your keyboard on and off. You, you can have a shortcut key for clearing your CMOS. If you're a crazy overclocking person and you love to clear your CMOS or you're, you've overclocked so much your system is slightly unstable, there's also a shortcut key option to do the safely remove hardware. But here's the big feature. It actually can do an audio switch. So if you want to switch between front panel audio and rear audio or USB audio and rear audio, USB audio switch is one of the macros that are supported with this motherboard. One of the things that Asus has added with this motherboard is a low dropout pre-regulator that is a voltage regulator for lowering the amount of noise that the audio codec experiences, the Realtek ALC 1150, basically to take the noise out of the DC voltage that's going into the ALC 1150. Normally on the reference circuit, there's about a 90 millivolt ripple. With the regulator, it's down to about 44 millivolts. Theoretically, that should improve sound quality. There are also some other design considerations that have been done to try to reduce noise uh, and crosstalk and things like that from the, the built-in audio codec. One thing that they've done is redo the way things are laid out on the PCB to try to minimize the amount of noise introduced into the analog parts of the circuit, trace separation, layer separation. These are not really new for this generation of motherboard, but you know, know that those considerations have been made and that the testing has been done around that kind of stuff. And the left and right channels on this are of course separated as well. Now, if you've got a case window or you like showing off the inside of your computer, there's an RGB LED behind the PCH. So you can actually control this in software, depending on whatever color scheme you come up with or, or whatever you want to do. It's kind of like the GeForce Experience LED on the GeForce cards where you can sort of control and have it pulse and that kind of thing. But this also gives you control of the color as well because it's an RGB LED. You can have it pulse, strobe, whatever. You can set that in software. Now, the one thing we haven't talked about yet is fan control. Asus has usually gone completely over the top with fan control on all of their motherboards. You know, all the headers, DC control, PWM control, whatever you, you know, whatever you want. They've basically outdone themselves with the fan control on this, this platform again. In addition to having all those fan headers, each fan header is still controlled by DC or PWM, but in the UEFI, they've added a lot more features in terms of how those are controlled. 
So if you want to read from a particular temperature sensor and have a particular fan ramp up in response to that sensor, you can do that now in the UEFI. Not only that, you can actually choose the ramp up profile so that if the thing crosses from one threshold into another, it will change the speed slowly over a period of time, you know, 2.1 seconds, three seconds, five seconds, whatever. So, you know, you've got full control over exactly what you want to do with the fans on the headers and how they want to operate. Asus has also added this generation, a water pump header and so with this pump header you can control its reaction differently from the other headers so if you want a constant pump speed or you want a variable pump speed if your pump you know will read from the dc or pwm header you can pick dc or pwm mode for the the pump header as well so you could use it for a fan if you wanted to but you can also skip the ramp up ramp down situation with the pump because with a pump if it goes from you know low to high you're probably not going to be able to hear that if you've got a reasonably good pump so the situation with the water pump is maybe a little different than fans, but they've taken that into consideration in the, in the UEFI, which is really just shows the attention to detail that they have in their UEFI. So this generation in terms of actually flashing, of course, USB BIOS flashback is still here. You can even get to that from a keyboard shortcut on your keyboard if you set that up in the, in the key control software. You can also flash from the internet now, so you don't even have to fool with anything. You can just go into your UEFI and say internet update. And as long as you're on the internet, which basically means you're, you're plugged in with a wire and you've got you know DHCP going, you can download your UEFI update from the internet. And that's not the first time I've seen internet flashing from the UEFI but I'm glad to see it on these motherboards. There are some other enhancements to the UEFI. They've sort of refined how the GPU post stuff works so that it shows you, like when you plug in your GPU, you can actually go in the UEFI and confirm that your GPU is linked up at, you know, by 16 or by eight by eight if you're running an SLI configuration. And new this generation, they're also adding support for SMART. And so SMART is a protocol that goes with SATA hard drives and well, typically just about any storage device. And SMART stands for self-monitoring and reporting tool. But basically, it's sort of a built-in low-level diagnostic for storage devices that is meant to be an early warning system for if you have hardware problems and your storage device is dying so that you can copy your stuff off of it before it actually dies. Sometimes stuff dies and you don't get any smart warning, but sometimes you do. They've added support in UEFI not just for the smart warning system, but for you to actually dump the smart variables and see them. Because some drives, like the error count, will go up but it won't actually report an error or it'll report an error in sort of a meek anemic way. Like, you know, gosh, I'm, I'm getting a lot of read errors, but it's probably okay. I'll, I'll hang in there chief. And then it's just, you know, the drive dies and craps out. And it's like, what, why didn't you tell me? And it's like, well, I left you a memo at the bottom of your locked desk drawer that I guess you didn't see that. Uh, thanks. So you can actually dump the smart variables in the UEFI and keep an eye on them. You can also see drive temperature and some other, other parameters like that, which is nice. I have a feeling in the next generation of the UEFI, they'll make it so that the fans can be controlled by the temperature as reported by smart on your hard drives, which will be really important if you've got one of those Samsung M.2s that gets hotter than the surface of the sun because, good lord, those things run hot. As it stands now, you'll just have to rely on the temperature sensors on the motherboard. Now this motherboard actually does have one external temperature input. And so for the last three or four generations of ASUS boards, they've had the optional external temperature sensors that you can plug into the headers. Now we've seen that on the Sabertooth and the Griffin and some other variants, but this motherboard actually has one header. And so if you have one of those aforementioned Samsung drives, I, I would recommend getting one of the temperature sensors and placing it on the Samsung drive and then linking that up to a fan so that you have a fan that ramps up if the Samsung decides to become hotter than the sun you can actually do that with this motherboard, which is nice. Now in terms of overclocking, this motherboard is not Republic of Gamers, and you think Republic of Gamers, you think overclocking, but this motherboard actually has a lot of overclocking features as well. The Intel Skylake platform in general has changed the way that overclocking works, and we've got another overclocking video coming out to talk about that, and, and sort of an overclocking guide for Skylake, if you will. That's not ready yet, but hopefully not too long after this video goes live, that will actually be out, but we can talk about it, the features on this motherboard for it for just a second. One of the things is that the base clock, the BCLK, can be controlled now in one megahertz increments, and it's sort of decoupled from the other buses in the system. With prior generation CPUs, messing with that clock meant that you were also messing with the memory clock and the peripheral interface clock and some other clocks in the system, and so just because the CPU could handle the higher clock speed didn't necessarily mean that the RAM or the peripherals could handle the clock speed.
speed in exactly the same way. And also the multipliers, the relationship between the, the clock speed of the CPU and the clock speed of all the other peripherals. It's a little different in, in terms of how that works. Skylake breaks all that out and basically gives you individual control. And so Skylake out of the box with the reference imp implementation will run at up to 170 megahertz. Now really it's just 100 megahertz but the Intel default BCLK generator will only go up to 170 megahertz. Well, Asus has sort of eschewed that and put their own on there that goes up to 450 megahertz. Now you're not gonna get a CPU that runs at that speed unless you're on liquid nitrogen and even then, I don't think that that's really gonna work out for you. But you've got some options as far as messing around with, with the BCLK. So you've got your own Asus provided clock generator for messing around with that on this platform. I haven't done that yet because this is so new, but I can't wait to play with it. Now that also enables a little better overclocking functionality in terms of what ASUS is calling five-way optimization. With the five-way optimization setup where you can do a hotkey overclock, one of the default ones out of the box is Control T. So you can press Control T at post and that'll enable the TPU stage one overclock profile. That's a mild overclock of the system and it's suitable for most air coolers. Uh, there's also the five-way optimization option, which you can do from within AI Suite 3, and the five-way optimization option will basically try to automatically find the optimal overclock for the platform, and then you'll be able to run with that. But that's part of Asus's software suite, and you do actually have full overclock control from within the UEFI as well. So depending on whatever you're comfortable with or whatever you actually want to do, you've got both options. Now one feature that I almost overlooked is called Mobo Connect. Now this is available on the Z170 Deluxe and the Z170A. This will actually let you pass through your keyboard and mouse to an Android device connected over USB. I hadn't seen this before. There may be other utilities out there that do this, but this is really cool. So you can basically use your mouse and your keyboard on your Android device in software. You just hit rig up a hotkey and then it will pass through control of your mouse and keyboard to your Android device. So if you've got a stand on your desk for your phone, you can just hit a hotkey and then you can actually use your keyboard and mouse to reply to things. And until Google figures out replying to text messages on the desktop that does not involve Google Hangouts, uh, this seems like a really good solution for replying to text messages quickly if you're at your computer. Well, that's been the hopefully quick, but probably in reality, not actually very quick, overview of the Z170 Deluxe from Asus. If you guys would like to see a build with this or some more stuff about this motherboard, let us know in the comments or head on over to the forums at techsyndicate.com. I'd really like to do something special with this, but I'm not sure what. I'm thinking about doing a, a Linux workstation video where we actually use the integrated GPU for Linux and then we do hardware pass-through of, of another GPU for Windows, a Windows virtual machine, this motherboard might be a pretty good fit for that. Right now, there are some problems with the Linux kernel around Skylake, at least the limited testing that I did uh, when I enabled the iGPU, I managed to get a boot loop. It's probably something to do with the new OpenGL support on Skylake, which is probably already fixed by the time this video comes out. I just haven't gotten the patches yet. So if you'd like to see something like that, let us know in the comments or head on over to the forum at techsyndicate.com. I'm Wendell, and I'm signing out.